Carl Rocks. He's with the USDA ARS at Penn State. And um, he's going to talk to us about environmental impact of dairy production systems. Make sure you've heard it already. So, that okay. so this is a, a relatively large project that I'm going to be reporting on today. It involves many things, but we're going to kind of focus on this environmental impact. A long list of collaborators and co authors on this, and I'll show them at the end. But I'd like to start just by pointing out the keepers, and Karen Veltman is sort of the lead on this. She's a research associate at the University of Michigan, uh, working under uh, Olivier Joliet. Okay, it's not advancing. This isn't working at all. Um, so dairy in the Northeast uh, remains a, a very vital industry, I guess. But it, it has its challenges, particularly right now. And we'll go into that a little bit. But, uh, over recent years, um, Northeast dairy produ has produced about 78 billion pounds of milk per year. This is about 36% of the total U.S. production. Much of this, or most, the majority of this, comes from the three states of Wisconsin, New York, and Pennsylvania. Uh, Michigan is also a three major player in this. And of course, there's um, milk being produced in all the states, really. So, what are the challenges? Well, they have economic challenges as we face more uh, a global market for milk and so forth. And we're working with relatively small farms in this region, and makes them a little more challenged maybe than, than some in the West. Uh, we also have the regional challenges of the environmental impacts. We have large water bodies, the Great Lakes and Chesapeake Bay. We get a lot of attention over the eutrophication matters, and a lot of that comes back on farms, particularly dairy farms in our region. Then we have the global challenges like greenhouse gas emissions. And their effect on climate change. Over the past year, 6.5% of the total farms, dairy farms in this region closed. So uh, they are having trouble addressing these challenges. This has led to um, the establishment of this project that we refer to as Sustainable Dairy. It was funded by a USDA NIFA cap grant. Involves 15 or more universities and institutions, at least 35 researchers and their support, and is addressing five major objectives or areas of, of, of emphasis, including measurement uh, of various emissions, modeling, life cycle assessment, extension, uh, and education. So what my primary involvement has been in the, in the modeling aspect and uh, also in a, as it's interfaces with life cycle assessment. If you can remember back two years, uh, Karen Veltman actually reported a, uh, on this work, looking at the assessment of beneficial management practices to reduce carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus losses on our dairy farms. That work has now been covered. So now we're taking that a step further and looking at uh, taking those BMPs into the future, basically looking at climate change and, and adapting to that climate change and the in interaction really with the, these best, best management practices. So that's what I'm going to address today. So in the Northeast, we are facing more variable weather patterns, generally warmer temperatures, and general greater precipitation and even maybe more important, more intense storms. You may not be aware of it. I mean, it is kind of Incredible that over the past two decades, storm intensity in the Northeast, more than any place else in the United States, this has increased by 70%. And we experienced that in great measure this past summer. So, climate change has many impacts on dairy farms. What we usually focus on is crops, yields, perhaps quality, the timeliness of field operations, harvest losses, food quantity and quality animal stress and how they perform, that the nutrient requirements of animals, uh, emissions to the environment, and then all the way to production costs and profit. 
So our objective was to conduct a, a comprehensive assessment of the effects of climate change on both the productive productivity and environmental performance of the farms as influenced by strategies to reduce emissions and adapt to changing climate. So our, our procedure was to model uh, three different farms, one in each state of New York, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin, simulate those farms with and without these best management practices under recent climate, historical climate, and projected mid-century climate. So the three farms varied in size, uh, which is typical across our region, smaller farms in Pennsylvania, larger farms in New York, Wisconsin, somewhere often in the middle. Although we have larger farms in Pennsylvania and, and you know, the farm size distribution across the whole state, it tend, this is the way it tends to be. So we, we looked at a 1,500 cow farm in New York and 1,300 hectares of land, crops being alfalfa, grass, corn silage, and, and corn grain. With Wisconsin, we're looking at 150 cows plus replacements and 132 hectares of, of land. Uh, Pennsylvania, uh, 50 cows and 50 hectares. The crops are generally similar across the farms, but the cropping strategies and some of the things are different as we move across these different uh, production areas. So we're modeling and simulating these farms with our integrated farm system model. Uh, if you're not familiar with that model, it is somewhat unique and it is a process level simulation of the whole farm system. So we're simulating all the uh, important um, processes from crop growth and development, harvest, storage, feeding of the animals, predicting what they're going to excrete based upon how they're fed, tracking those nutrients back and looking at the losses and that occur at each step throughout the, uh, the process. We normally simulate these farms over 20 to 25 years of, of weather to get sort of a long-term look at their performance and environmental impact. This includes some life cycle assessment where we look at the what's represented here is greenhouse gases or the direct emissions from the farm, but we're also looking at the pre-chain or upstream emissions or, or inputs from from the resources that are being produced and used on the farm. So for our simulation results that I'll be showing, we're going to look at, uh, in this case, crop yields and food production uh, from, the, from the different, uh, using the different strategies, greenhouse gas emissions or the carbon footprint of the milk produced, total reactive nitrogen loss uh, from the farm, which we'll refer to as the nitrogen footprint, and then we're also looking at the total phosphorus loss, so over the uh, farm out, just crossing the farm boundaries. So this goes back to what was presented two years ago, uh, where we looked at this variety of uh, what we call best management practices. We have five or six here under uh, different feeding strategies, different manure handling strategies, and then different field strategies. And this just illustrates the carbon footprint and how it's affected by the use of these individual strategies. And then what we came up with was combining some of the uh, better or more important strategies to get uh, a, com a combined impact. So what we were able to show was, that in, like in this case, it's a 36% reduction in the carbon footprint for the milk. Implementing these strategies, we got similar reductions in, in nitrogen and phosphorus losses. And we we're able to do this without, without maintaining and maybe even improving farm profitability. So for this particular work now, we're going to be working with these four feeding strategies. We were looking at lowering the forage ration, the forage content in the rations, uh, looking at using, increasing the fiber digestibility of feeds, uh, improving the feed efficiency of the animals through genetics, and also looking at feeding protein more efficiently to just more accurately meet um, NRC requirements. For manure handling strategies, uh, for the smaller farms, we were using bedded pack, which is common in our region, uh, for 
the, in the replacement heifer raising. We looked at replacing that with freestyle barns. We looked at looking at, looked at uh, liquid solid separation, anaerobic digestion on the largest farm in New York. In the smaller farms, we just looked at uh, putting a cover and sealing the manure storage and using a flare to burn the gas that was produced. The cropping strategies, we looked at using a cover crop or double crop uh, of small grain with, with corn, uh, no-till crop establishment, and subsurface uh, injection of manure. The climate analyses, uh, we were working with six different climate models in this study uh, to pr project uh, this future climate weather conditions that we were simulating under. We also looked at increasing the CO2 levels in the atmosphere and that, that impact on crop growth and development. Three of the climate models were used to predict representative concentration pathways of 8.5. And if you're not familiar with that terminology, it's basically business as usual, just looking at how uh, the recent emissions of greenhouse gases that we've been uh, emitting from the United States and continuing that into the future. 4.5 then was looking at pretty, a pretty substantial reduction. If we could pretty much immediately and continuously reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. So in reality, as we look towards mid-century, we're probably somewhere between those, but uh, hopefully closer to 4.5, but probably closer to 8.5. Um, some of the adaptation strategies that we looked at, uh, and adjusting the planting and harvesting dates as we change the climate, we can adjust those to more favorably uh, work with the climate, look at uh, crop variety, particularly with corn, using a longer season corn, a longer growing season, and some use of double cropping. So first, this is a, a look at corn, at crop yield, and I'll be focusing, or I'll be showing here the New York farm, just to say farm, but the numbers do change across the different farms, but the trends are the same. So I think it, it all leads to the same conclusion as we get to it. The crop yields, if you just follow one color at a time, it started with green with for alfalfa. As we go from recent history to uh, mid-century, without any adaptation, you can see the alfalfa is responding some with a higher yield, primarily because of higher CO2 levels in the atmosphere. If we can adapt that crop and actually maybe add another cutting uh, per year, we can increase the, the forage production from alfalfa. Uh, this bar represents corn silage. Uh, by going uh, into the future, we're able to almost maintain uh, corn silage product production if we adapt by double cropping, and that's what's happening here. Corn silage yield is going down, but overall, with the small grain, uh, Salad production in conjunction with that, we're getting quite an increase in forage production. Uh, the, the yellow bars here for corn grain, uh, as we move into mid century, we're losing yield. If we adapt our crop, we can maybe regain a little, but for the most part, uh, we cannot uh, offset uh, the impacts of, of warmer climate on what it's predicting for corn grain yields in the future. If we implement our BMPs, basically it's just saying that we're kind of, we can maintain about the same yields. In some cases we're doing a little better, in some cases a little worse, but pretty much the same. As far as carbon footprint of the milk produced, uh, this is looking at uh, the base farm without any BMPs implemented. Uh, as we move into the future, you can see the carbon footprint is going up. With some adaptation, uh, we can bring it down a little bit, but it remains a little higher than what we've been experiencing over the past, say, 20 years. If we look at implementing these BMPs, so we can greatly reduce the uh, carbon footprint and greenhouse gas emissions from the farm. Uh, and I think the more interesting thing to note is that as we, we also determine more stable as we look into the future. Uh, we can maintain the carbon footprint uh, with these best management practices implemented. 
for reactive nitrogen loss, uh, we have some, a similar picture. Uh, with implementing the right DMPs, we can uh, reduce this substantially. Here where we see some uh, variation as we move into the, into the future, but with the right adaptation, we're keeping it pretty close to uh, what we've been experiencing recently. <coughs> this is a look at phosphorus loss from the farm. Again, sort of the same kind of picture, but a little bit more variation. And, oops. Uh, you can see here, uh, we've got a fairly substantial increase as we move to mid-century. And a lot of that is because of the increase in rain, rainfall and more intense storms, less snow, that sort of thing. Uh, so even with our best management practices implemented, we cannot maintain phosphorus losses down to the level, which has been too high in Chesapeake Bay region. It's been, it's been a problem, and it's, that problem looks like it's going to grow. So in conclusion, um, without the mitigation uh, measures, the, the environmental impact of dairy production system will increase by mid-century. Uh, feed production can be maintained uh, as decreases in corn grain yields can be compensated or offset by increases in forage yields. Uh, adaptation of the cropping system provides a small increase in green grain yields, but it, it appears, at least from a modeling standpoint, that the detrimental effects of climate change cannot be fully negated uh, by adaptation. Of course, a lot of things can change there as we continue to develop new varieties and, and adapt perhaps the corn to the new climate. And finally, uh, ad adoption of these farm-specific DMPs can substantially reduce greenhouse gas emissions and other nutrient losses uh, in the current climate. And as we look to the future, for the most part, they're helping uh, stabilize, let's say, uh, these losses uh, so that we will not experience much more in the future, with the exception perhaps, of, of erosion and phosphorus runoff losses. So this work has really focused on up to the farm gate, looking at everything that goes into the producing the resources and the, and the milk on the farm. This work is continuing, uh, uh, looking at uh, all the other processes uh, for processing the milk, retail, consuming, and even looking at the waste produced by the consumers. So through LCA. Uh, this work will be primarily done by um, uh, Greg Tom and his group at the University of Arkansas. They're working on that. Should be finalized uh, just within the next few months. So with that, as promised, these are the co-authors uh, on this work. That, uh,